Okay, we want to uh, jump ahead here to slide 401. <laughs> oh me. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> if you're following along, we're on slide 401 now. Uh, we're skipping over some things. <clears throat> uh, that uh, exam? doesn't matter whether we talk about it. If it's on the slides. It's there. Begrudging obedience. Yeah, begrudging obedience. Thank you for that. No blessing for him. Uh, okay. So we're looking again at the scriptures. We talk a lot about the Bible, uh, but it's helpful to be able to uh, uh, determine how best to again understand the Bible relative to the issue of ethics. And one of the things we need to recognize here is the 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 various uh, parts and aspects of Scripture itself when it comes to ethics. Now. Uh, Imagine that uh, you woke up one Christmas morning and there was a box under the tree and you're eight years old and uh, the box was a box with an unassembled bicycle inside. And, uh, but nobody in your family, neither your family nor yourself, knew what a bicycle was. <laughs> and so dad comes in and goes, I guess I'll have to put this together, but dad doesn't have a picture of a bicycle. He doesn't have any instructions for a bicycle. He just sees all this stuff, right? And an Allen wrench. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden he's uh, looking at wheels and pedals and uh, uh, he's going to put something together. He doesn't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. even if he knew what it should look like, even if he knew how it should work once it was put together, uh, even if he were able to sort of cobble it together what if he'd never seen a bicycle could he cobble it together hmm he didn't know a picture of what a bicycle is could he cobble it together if he had a picture in his mind then yeah maybe he could put it together but if he didn't have a picture in his mind you can imagine how impossible it would be to assemble this device without a picture in your mind of what it is you were trying to put together well, for a lot of us, uh, a lot of us, the bicycle, the Bible is like uh, a bicycle in a box with parts and no instructions. So one of the first things a new Christian encounters is somebody will say, "Well, the first thing you need to do is buy a Bible." You go, well, "Okay, whatever that is," <laughs> and you get a Bible, and then you sort of go, "Well, what is it? What do I do with it?" I open it up, and I don't. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, uh, and you begin to read parts of it, and some parts of it makes make more sense than other parts of it make, but you're not really quite sure overall what it is you're supposed to do with this whole book uh, because you don't have any really instructions about how it's meant to be put together, how it's meant to be seen as a, a total picture of something. And, uh, and so the same thing is true when it comes to uh, applying the Bible to ethical situations and circumstances. That uh, it helps to understand how the Bible is put together and uh, the finer tuning of the Bible if we're going to be able to use the Bible as a source for ethical guidance and uh, decision making. Uh, and that's a that's a big problem for most of us. It's a it's a, it's if you take the whole book seriously, it's a bigger problem than if you don't take the whole book seriously. So the more seriously we take the whole Bible, the more seriously we need to think about how its parts and its aspects all fit together, how they work together, uh, so that we derive the greatest benefit from it. And so what we want to look at this time is looking at this normative perspective in the Bible, particularly is uh, how, in fact, we do discern ethical standards in the Bible. And here we want to focus our attention on how uh, the different ways the various parts and aspects of Scripture communicate the norms of God to us. Okay, So, let's divide the discussion this way. Uh, first, let's look at the variety of materials we find in the Scripture. Secondly, let's look more closely at the books and passages that comprise the uh, commands, if you will, in Scripture. And lastly, the uh, look at the unity of Scripture that draws all parts of the Scripture together. And so we begin by looking at the variety we find in Scripture. 
Uh, what you realize when you read the Bible, if you read the Bible, or, uh, which everybody should be on an annual Bible reading plan. Is everybody on an annual Bible reading plan? Do I get an amen for that? I have an exhausted knowledge. No, I'm not asking the group. I'm looking right at you. <laughs> does, do, does anyone have an, uh, do you have a plan to read the Bible through every year? You should. You should have a plan to read the Bible through every year. And there are lots of plans out there. You can go on the Internet. and uh, Robert Murray McShane's is probably the most famous one-year Bible reading plan uh, what would you expect? He's a Scotsman, so he, of course, got it right. But anyway, it's a beautiful plan for reading the Bible through in one year, and uh, it's, I recommend it highly, but there are other ones out there as well. But the Robert Murray McShane uh, one-year Bible reading through uh, is a great plan. Well, anyway, the first thing you discover, or hopefully one of the things you discover when you start reading the Bible, is that all of a sudden you've got all these different things in there, different ways of communicating, different genres, as we might say. Because you have historical books in the Bible. You think of Chronicles and Kings and Samuel and all that. And then you've got poetry. You think of the Psalms. You've got wisdom. You think of Proverbs. You think of uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Psalms, Songs. You think of prophecy, the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc. You think of correspondence. You think of the letters in the New Testament from Paul to various churches. Uh, and you see all these kinds of writings in the Bible. You see apocalyptic writing in the Bible, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. Uh, and so uh, when somebody says, just read the Bible, that's really not fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, I read the Bible. But be aware that the Bible is made up of lots of different kinds of literature. And not only that, it's not only the genre that the particular book may be written in, but also each author has his own personality, uh, his own context, his own particular audience that he's writing to in a particular period uh, in time. And that's varied throughout the Bible. So you don't read Paul and expect to get the same voice you get from reading Peter. Uh, or James, or you don't get the same voice, if you will, because each has a very unique personality that is uh, God accommodates himself to that personality, and he takes that personality and he uses it as a unique way of expressing himself through that personality. And he does that with some of the, writer, the writers of Scripture as well. So there's a huge variety of Scripture uh, within Scripture itself. So we discover that sometimes he gave very straightforward commands. Sometimes he explains in detail what he wants. Sometimes uh, there's a recollection of personal experience on the part of an author. Uh, and all of that variety isn't by accident. It isn't an accidental thing. It's a, a design thing. Uh, God has ordained each part of the Bible uh, to contribute in its own way to the standards of Christian obedience. Each part is ordained by God to contribute to the, the call for obedience to the standards or commands of Scripture. And because the Scripture communicates in so many different ways, it isn't sufficient for us to simply know what the Bible says. That is, just to know what the words are. We need to know more than that. We need to know how it is saying what it is saying, how it is communicating it. So then when we read it and read what it's saying, we actually understand what it means, what it means. And so you'll, you'll, one of the things you discover about most, most, uh, most what we commonly refer to as cults, you know, cult groups, cult organizations or whatever, uh, is that they read the Bible in a very different way than, than Christians uh, read the Bible. And that's one of the first things that stands out to you when you talk to somebody like that, is that there's a sort of, uh, uh, even a, it, there's either a sort of a fantastical view or there's a, such a woodenness to it that you, you're not comfortable with what you're hearing about what they're saying about the Bible. And that's a dead giveaway that they really, uh, well, A, they don't have the Holy Spirit, but B, that they really don't appreciate the, 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 the beautiful richness of Scripture, that it's very rich and subtle in all sorts of ways. And so they tend to ignore all that subtlety and all that richness of language. 
so, but to give a sense of this dimension of Scripture, uh, we need to look at least three things, three matters that this touches on. First, let's talk about the variety of language used in the Bible. Secondly, the variety of literature in the Bible. And thirdly, the implications of the variety of literature and language and what that has, implications that has for our ethical understanding. So look first at the smaller, uh, simpler matters related to language and then move to the larger, more complex issues of literature. So language in the first place. Uh, the, Bible, the Bible displays the full range of language that we would expect to find in any human communication. Any human communication. I mean, if, if you only speak to each other in straightforward uh, uh, propositional, or they would say, uh, assertorical language. Well, think about think about what kind of love language would that be? <laughs> I love you. Is dinner ready? Let's go to bed. Let's go to work. Let's read a book. Let's sleep. Let's make love. How? Uh, how interesting would your relationship be with that person? Very boring. <laughs> Very boring. Uh, uh, well, there certainly would be little or no doubt as to what exactly you meant, uh, but that would be a very boring communicative relationship, wouldn't it? There's the, w w how would you express emotion and love and passion and you can't do it with those kind of simple sentences can you it just doesn't work that way well the bible is full of this rich and robust diverse form of communication that really you know touches all various dimensions and aspects of people who they are their emotions their feelings their their cognitive functions all those things are there so you get statements you get questions you get promises you get offers you get curses you get blessings you get threats you get judgments quotations you get summations you get commands you get advice you get requests you get exclamations you get descriptions you get cries of despair expressions of desire admiration and love and much 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 more. That's what you find when you read the Bible. And that makes it a little more complicated in terms of understanding it, okay? Just like it makes human relationships more complicated, the more subtle our language is. So a biblical language can be emotionally reserved or it can be emotionally charged. Uh, and some of it can be very imaginative, uh, symbolism, figures of speech, uh, you, you read the book of Daniel, you read some of Ezekiel, Zechariah, you read the book of Revelation, you're going, this is fantastical, what is this? This is all this apocalyptic symbolism and all this kinds of stuff and your head starts spinning and, and you're just like, wow, this is not the way I normally talk, this is not the way I normally communicate. And it's a, it's a very vivid and very powerful. Uh, and so the Bible uh, it has all of those kinds of uh, speech forms in it. And remember that this is what God chose to use. This isn't an accident. This is a design by God to use these things. Uh, and so you find, for example, sarcasm in the Bible. If, you're not, if you don't understand sarcasm, you're going to lose a lot of assistance from the Bible. People always go, I don't get your humor, Dr. Payne. I say, well, you need to read more of the Bible. Because... All my humor comes out of the Bible. Didn't you know? Didn't you know? See? Just read the Bible. It's all there. Every joke I tell is in the Bible somewhere. Sarcasm. Sincere language. Uh, innuendo. Double entendre. An illusion. Wow. It's all there in the Bible. It uses hyperbole. In other words, overstatement, exaggeration. Uh, Paul, the, I am the chief of sinners. I know a lot worse sinners than Paul. <laughs> Me. Uh, hyperbolic, okay? So it's hyperbolic. Of course, he's exaggerating, but for effect. For effect. Obviously, he's doing that. He is a sinner, obviously. He's not the worst sinner that's ever lived. But, um, but he does it for effect. 
Or there's an understatement. Are there colloquialisms? In other words, there are expressions that are unique to a particular period of history and time and culture. Uh, many times it doesn't even bother to state the obvious. It simply assumes the obvious. That's the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the hardest part about being a teacher is you want to assume the obvious because you don't want to waste time, right? So, but then you got to go, well, I can't assume the obvious. I have to spend the time to explain what to me seems obvious. But to someone else, it might not be obvious at all. Well, the Scripture sometimes assumes the obvious. It doesn't spell it all out for you right there. And then you're scratching your head, and it's like, well, I don't quite get that. And then you go, oh, well, you need to read more. You need to read over here and over here. And then all of a sudden, the, it becomes clearer to you as you read it. So over the ages, Christians have proposed various ways of dealing with all this diversity. Uh, that presents itself to us in the variety of language in the Bible. Uh, and most of those uh, solutions fall into one of two groups. Uh, those who believe the Bible uses, the, uses language only in extraordinary ways, and those that believe the Bible uses language in very ordinary ways. And uh, if you think of the Bible in extraordinary language, as an extraordinary uh, language or communication uh, of language, uh, they offer solutions that ignore the different types of language in the Bible. In other words, rather, uh, they, they oversimplify the language in order to develop a system of interpretation that can be applied fairly equally to all the Bible. And so, you get that in the Middle Ages, for example, a sort of a fourfold or fivefold sense of Scripture. You see this among a lot of the, the medieval scholastics when they come to read the Bible. They're always looking for allegory. They're always looking for uh, allegory versus a literal meaning. The meaning that lies beneath the surface, the meaning, the meaning that lies above the surface, and they sort of develop a four or five fold strategy for interpreting biblical language, and then they apply it uniformly to all of the Bible. That's not the way to go. That's not the way to go. Because that, that suggests that there's something mystical or magical about the Word, that unless you have the right key, you'll never understand the Bible the way it's meant to be understood. But the Bible is written in ordinary language, the language people use. And people use interesting language to communicate, don't they? We all use different kinds of expressions to communicate in an everyday sense. You have slang words, you have shorthand expressions for things. This is ordinary language, the way people actually talk. So most more recently, you see this idea that Christians who believe the Scripture's language is extraordinary uh, have gone in the opposite direction. Instead of believing that the extraordinary nature of Scripture makes it hard to interpret, they insist that it makes its language easy to interpret. So they've argued that the Holy Spirit directly reveals what the words mean to, to people. Uh, and so it's not really important that you know how ordinary language works and how you were meant, you're meant to interpret that kind of a language. Uh, others argue that Scripture's language should always be interpreted just literally. Everything should just be interpreted literally. So that anything metaphorical... Uh, or non-figurative uh, or figurative uh, needs to be reduced to something literal, not figurative. So it's very literalistic in its interpretations of the Bible. Uh, so, for example, it's apparent that in ordinary communication, human beings commonly use overstatements or hyperbolic statements. But many Christians who are committed to biblical authority, that is, they believe the Bible, don't acknowledge that such hyperbole exists in the Bible. Instead, they treat every statement in Scripture as if it were straightforward, detached, and precise. Okay? Uh, that's... They want a high view of the Bible, but they focus on the literary, the literal meaning of everything. So metaphor, symbolism, 
figurative speech is got to be worked through to something simple, basic, and literal. That's the whole objective. Uh, but in ordinary speech and writing, we often summarize things, don't we? We have shorthand expressions because we assume the audience will know how to fill in the gaps of what we're saying. Now, I don't know, have a word. I don't have a clue what you people are talking about. Nine hundred ninety-nine percent out of a thousand times. But uh, if you were in America, you would find the same feeling. When you, if you were hanging out with me and my friends, you would be going like, what did he mean by that? And they all know what I mean by that. Because there's a shorthand expression for something in my language and in my culture that would not be familiar to you. And just as there is in your culture, there's shorthand expressions. That, so there are huge gaps. When I'm listening or, or I think I'm listening, I don't have a clue what you're even talking about. Because I don't. I'm not familiar with the gaps in language that are employed by you to communicate in a simple way to each other. You get the joke, I don't. Uh, you come to my place, you won't get the joke, I will. And that's just the way it is. So uh, the scriptures are, are in many respects just like that. They assume certain things on the part of the person reading and, and the, the book or the portion of scripture that they have before them. Uh, and so that's exactly what the inspired writers of Scripture did. Paul uses expressions that were obvious to the people he was writing to originally, but to me they may be obscure, they may be difficult to understand. And just the same thing is true of the Old Testament. People in the New Testament era reading the Old Testament scratch their heads and go, what is he talking about? Well, it requires work on the part of the reader to figure that out and determine what that is and to treat the, uh, the passages with the integrity uh, they deserve. So, <clears throat> so beyond that, we recognize in uh, ordinary writing and speech uh, that people will be sarcastic and say the opposite of what they mean. Uh, you know, English humor is, uh, is, is often referred to as very dry humor. And so it comes across as not funny at all. But to them, they think it's hysterical. Uh, you know, the idea, of, uh, the idea of a play on words, a pun. And they're like, you know, you, they love this stuff. And the average American goes, what? Uh, you know, I didn't get that. So, uh, so anyway, you, re you, see, you see what, we, what we, we're getting at here. That, uh, that as believers, we have to remember the Bible is full of all of this stuff. There's sarcasm, there's humor, there's, uh, there, there are shorthand expressions for things. There all, it's all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's not that the Bible is made up of some sort of extraordinary language. In fact, it's made up of that rather uh, ordinary language. And it uses all the normal conventions of human communication. So uh, in, 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 as a, to illustrate that, uh, consider a couple of passages where, passage where an overly literal reading would be misleading. An overly literal reading would be misleading. If you take the passage in Matthew 6, 11, the petition there, uh, give us today our daily bread. Now, in some cultures, when they read that, they think of bread. I mean, I've had that happen to me before in Africa. Because okay, bread's really important. <laughs> but uh, you give us this day our daily bread. And you're thinking bread, like real bread. And, uh, and of course, that is not exactly what Jesus is, a is talking about there. So if you read it in an artificially literal way, ap apart from the conventions of normal human expression in the time when the Gospels were written, it's like Jesus is telling God, give us bread, give, give us bread, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, and in fact, all the petitions in the Lord's Prayer take the form of imperatives. In effect, then Jesus is saying, I'm commanding you, give us bread, give us bread. They're all imperatives, give us bread, give us bread. Uh, or deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from the evil one. Uh, and in, in Greek grammar, Imperatives are often, most often in fact, commands. Uh, and that fact has led some Christians who read the Bible in an overly literal way to consider that Jesus was commanding God to do something. Commanding Him to do something. After all, it is an imperative in the Greek text. Therefore, it must be a command God, Jesus is giving to the Father to do this. 
And since the Lord's Prayer is a model we're supposed to follow, uh, they conclude that we, we have the right to issue commands to God too. So it's God's obligated to give me bread. After all, the Lord's Prayer says, give us our daily bread. God, give me my daily bread. And that's a command we issue to God. Give us the bread. Lord, Jesus said to do this. We're doing it. So give us the bread. Uh, but from the rest of Scripture, and from uh, including His own words in the Lord's Prayer, we know that imperative verbs are, are used often to express requests, not demands. An imperative can be used to express a request. And that's true in English as well. Uh, when, when you're sitting at the dinner table and somebody says, pass the bread, we always uh, occasionally or maybe most often will say, please. But you don't even have to say please depending on how you say it. Pass the bread? It's understood. Please, pass the bread. Or pass the bread! Okay, same words. Was well, it a command or a request? Pass the bread? Pass the bread! Okay, you know from the tone of voice, you know from the inflection. In other words, the words themselves have to be understood in a larger way or else we end up with these commands which are really requests. And so, or, or help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Well, there's a question mark on one of those. <laughs> and oh, by the way, in the Greek New Testament, there are no question marks. There are no periods. There are no exclamation points. <laughs> there are no commas. <laughs> there are none of those things, okay? So, uh, so you can see the point here that, that what could appear to be one thing might in fact be something different than what you think it is if you interpret it just simply literally. Uh, and so you don't have a command there. What you have from Jesus is a request, a petition. Give us this day our daily bread basically, not demanding anything of the Father, basically requesting that He do it. Uh, if you take Amos 4, verse 4, where the prophet says, go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. That's one of my favorite verses. <laughs> That's a life verse. <laughs> go, go to Bethel. See, nobody laughs. Anyway, go to Bethel and sin. And go to Gilgal and sin yet more. All right, Miroslav? Did you hear what I just said? I'm doing it already. <laughs> Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Oh, well, gee, that seems a little odd. Doesn't it seem odd to you? I think it sounds odd. I'm the only one in the room who thinks so. Well, an overly literal reading of that verse has led some interpreters to think that Amos actually wanted his listeners to sin against the Lord at the idolatrous worship centers at Bethel and Gilgal. But that, that kind of a reading is uh, unnatural and doesn't account for his intentions. That, this, this is such a perfect illustration, an apt illustration, of what, how you can use an expression that in a literal sense would be terrible, but that's clearly not what's intended. Go, do, go be bad. Go do this bad stuff. Go do. It's almost sarcastic. It's, it's really what he's getting at here. Uh, his intention is revealed in another text. For example, in Amos 5.5, 5, he says, Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Well, wait a minute. He said go to Bethel and go to Gilgal and sin. Now he says do not go to Bethel and do not go to Gilgal. So what's the key to the understanding of the text here? What, what are we supposed to do? Well, from the, that verse and the rest of the book of Amos, we conclude that when the prophet ordered the people to sin at Bethel and Gilgal, he was being sarcastic. Yeah, go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin some more. Now, do you think I really want you to go to Bethel and go to Gilgal and sin some more? No. It's like, sure, go ahead, go. You see the point? If you don't appreciate this, then you're, there's a lot of the Bible is just going to go way over your head. And you're going to go, wow, what is that? I think I'll skip the book of Amos. In other words, he's speaking sarcastically. He means the opposite of what he's saying. It's like your 
kid goes out, gets drunk, comes home, two days later, they're getting ready to go. Yeah, sure, go out, get drunk again. Do you really want them to go out and get drunk again? Of course not. The point, you're trying to make a point using a sarcastic expression. And, of course, your child usually figures that out after a few times. But anyway, uh, he didn't want them to sin in those places. He, didn't, he wanted them not to sin. And he was using a very interesting Hebrew expression to get them to do that, which is sarcastic. So the mechanics of the Bible's language are not unique in Scripture. Uh, the Bible uses the conventions available to the authors at the time in which they wrote and communicated. In other words, these would be common ways people would communicate with each other. And so if we're going to interpret the Bible responsibly, we have to learn how they ordinarily use language and understand what they intended by the way they used the language they used. And if the, the author designed his words to be understood metaphorically, then we ought to understand them more metaphorically and, uh, and search for the meaning of the text uh, as best we can. Uh, if the author crafted his words plainly and directly, then you need to interpret them in the plain and direct way, in a non-figurative way. So the variety of language itself is important to appreciate if we're going to use the Bible for our ethical decision making. Uh, otherwise, you can take the passage of Amos 4 and create a lot of problems. <laughs> uh, so, and so just as there are varieties of language in Scripture, there are varieties of literature in Scripture. Uh, and this is, these are larger, more complex groups of writing, if you will, and, uh, and they can be difficult to master. But uh, understanding them is central to handling the parts of Scripture and aspects of Scripture responsibly. Uh, so there are many different forms or genres of literature in Scripture. So what we have, just to name a few, we have prose, we have poetry, we have song, we have law, we have narrative, we have letter, we have vows, we have epistles, we have prophetic voice, we have oracle, proverb, we have drama. Well, right away, you can see right there that reading your Bible is not just like no big deal. I mean, what's the difference between the poetic and the prose? What's a, what's a vow? What's a song? What's a drama? What's a parable? What is all this stuff? And so those broader forms, even within those broader forms, there are even some smaller forms buried in there as well. For example, when the literary form of prophetic oracle, we find oracles of judgment, oracles of blessing, oracles patterned after a lawsuit, and goes on and on and on and on and on. So even among the larger prophetic oracle category, there are all sorts of different kinds of oracles you find in the Bible. And they're distinguished by their content as well as by their structure and their style and their use of language. And each biblical genre communicates its own meaning in its own way, various ways. So we have to be aware of the complexity of the language of the Bible. We also have to be aware of the complexity of the various literary forms that are in the Bible. And you thought it was all going to be easy. Everybody thinks it's going to be... <laughs> anyway, usually when we do ethics, uh, we focus on, focus on passages in the Bible that contain law. Uh, that is, they're sort of commandments, obligations, very simple uh, moral standards. And of course, those are obviously very important to our ethics in developing our ethics. But we should never make the mistake that the other genres don't have anything to offer us in terms of ethical instruction. We make a big mistake when we do that. You might as well never read the Psalms. Because it's poetry. Whatever you do, don't read Ecclesiastes or or the Song of Songs, or whatever you do, don't read that. Well, anyway, so we should uh, not make the mistake of thinking that they have little or nothing to teach us about ethical instructions. So we should note that biblical narratives also communicate ethical rules and regulations. In other words, a narrative is a kind of historical story. And a story also communicates ethical principles or ethical uh, instructions to us. So if we think it only is found in the Ten Commandments, 
or verses like that, then we're missing out on this vast body of writing in the Bible that is likewise for our ethical instruction. So, for example, poetry and songs express ethical instruction. Proverbs, wisdom writing generally reflect ethical values. Prophecy expresses God's judgment. Remember we said one of the great ways of knowing what God likes or dislikes is His reaction to things. So you read the Old Testament and you see His reaction. There may be no explicit command from God about something, but by looking at His reaction, you go, well, it obviously it's not something we should do. And that's a great way to fill out and embellish your understanding of what's ethically important in the Bible. Uh, so we saw in earlier lessons that every passage in the Bible reveals God's character. And so every passage contains ethical teaching, whether it's a legal code, a letter, a poem, or a proverb, or a historical narrative, or any other kind of literature. So uh, when we're doing ethics, when you're doing ethics, uh, you need to search all types of biblical literature for their revelations of God's ethical standards. Okay, So you have to look at all these different forms of literature in the Bible uh, because all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture is. The poetry, the song, as well as the law, and the narrative, the prose, the apocalyptic, all of it is valuable and essential for us to understand God's ethical instructions for His people. And so, if you think about uh, uh, narratives, biblical narratives and ethics, you think of narratives, you think of the historical books of the Bible, those are all narratives. The Gospels are basically narratives, they're historical books as well. Uh, there are very specific ways in which historical narratives contribute to our understanding and study of the practice of Christian ethics. So let's focus in on narratives right now. Uh, biblical narratives uh, obligate us to accept, first of all, their factual content. Okay, Accept their factual... Yeah, we're stuck with uh, 15. But we'll follow you in the narrative. But I'm on 4.30. I wonder why it's not moving. I don't know. My computer's fine. You think there's a dark force? In, there. in every Mac, there is a dark force. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, but Steve Jobs is dead. It's Bill. Bill Gates is the devil, right? Yes. That's Bill Gates. Yeah. Yes. That's that's <laughs> word, right? Thomas. Okay. Anyway. Uh, it's not working, is it? Well, then you're just stuck with it. Sorry. Uh, so let's give five ways to uh, in which historical narratives contribute to your study of the practice of ethic. You have those, don't you? Don't yeah. you? Okay, good. So on a basic, a very basic level, uh, the uh, narratives obligate us to accept their factual content, that they are factual stories. They're not made-up stories. They're about real people at real times doing real things, and God is directing providentially this story for a reason. So we're obligated to believe that the details of redemptive history are true, okay, true. If you go into it believing that it's just, just a complete fabrication and fiction, well, it isn't going to be much help to us. Uh, and, of course, there are reasons not to believe that. We don't have time to go into. But you have to accept them as statements of fact. They're real people doing real things at a real period in history, or else they're going to be of little or no value to you. And that's especially true when it comes to central events like the Gospels themselves. Uh, for example, Jesus' death, His burial, His resurrection, the ascension, the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. These things are true and they really happened. If they didn't and not true, then you know, might as well forget using them for ethical instruction, which that means get rid of the whole Bible. Uh, it's also true with regard to every other fact that Scripture teaches us through these narratives. In other words, the mere presentation of these facts in biblical narratives obligates us to believe in them. They're presented as something to believe is real. They're presented as something to believe in, not to just imagine it might be true, but to actually believe that this really happened. Uh, the second reason that biblical narratives are important to Christian ethics is that biblical history has the power to transform us ethically. 
biblical history has the power to transform us ethically. In other words, knowing the content of biblical history is part of becoming a Christian. Knowing the content of biblical history is part of becoming a Christian. Uh, we saw this uh, early on in the very first uh, lesson. Only good people are capable of good things. And only those who have genuine saving faith in the gospel can be called good people according to the Bible. And in order for us to have saving faith in Christ, we have to know who Christ is and what He's done. So it's all linked together with a real person having done a real thing, and that benefit of that real thing is what I place my faith in, and that's what makes me a Christian. And those facts we learn from the historical record of the Bible, the narratives of the Bible. So knowing some biblical history is necessary if we're going to have saving faith in Christ. There has to be a real Jesus to believe in. There has to be a Jesus who actually did something for us to believe in. If he's just this mythical figure that we just pull out of the sky somewhere, a nice guy, real example, then that's not going to give produce saving faith. He's a real historical person who did who lived a perfect life in this world and died a perfect death on a cross at Calvary and rose from the dead the third day and now sits at the right hand of the Father. That's the gospel message right there. And it's all rooted in the narrative of Jesus and the narratives of the Bible uh, in its totality, the Old Testament as well. So biblical narratives, thirdly, provide the historical setting for God's laws. In other words, God did not simply plop down a bunch of rules. The rules are embedded in a historical narrative, a story, if you will. And the law is there embedded in that story. And so to understand the law of God properly, we have to understand the historical context in which the law was given. And, uh, for example, we have to see the biblical narratives emphasize God's grace in order to motivate us to obey. Okay, so God's grace becomes the motivation for obedience. You think of the Ten Commandments. If you read the Ten Commandments without reading the prelude to the Ten Commandments, then, then you're missing the point. Because Exodus 20, verse 2, which is the prelude to the Ten Commandments sets the Israelites, the people of God, up for what it means to follow the Ten Commandments. And it starts with what? It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of slavery. And then, now that you know who you are and why you are who you are, here is what you should be doing so that you are consistently reflecting my glory before the world. So the Ten Commandments, apart from the redemption of God, is just a bunch of rules. But when you understand the context of redemption, then the rules make sense. They, 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 in perfectly good sense, they fit perfectly with what's going on. So that short historical introduction to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 verse 2 provides what? It provides a motivation to obey them. It provides the motivation to, to obey them. Why should I obey them? Because you were redeemed from bondage in Egypt. I have saved you. Now you will want to follow me and obey me. And so uh, uh, it, 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 striving to obey them without the motivation of gratitude will never lead to true obedience. Obedience is really nothing more, if you think about it, it's nothing more than a reflection of gratitude, thankfulness that you have been redeemed out of Egypt, out of bondage to slavery. Now for us, the bondage wasn't in a physical place called Egypt, but it was bondage to sin. Yeah, well, I can't remember the text, the exact text, but John Newman, Newton famously kept on his wall over his fireplace and in front of his desk, and every day he would sit and look at the wall, and, and the verse was from Deuteronomy, I can't remember the exact verse, but, the, but basically it said, Behold, I have redeemed you from bondage in Egypt. And Newton knew what it meant to be redeemed from bondage to his own sin. And every day he would see that and be reminded that everything I do in obedience is out of gratitude for that. If I don't remember that, then it just becomes slavery to being good. And that will destroy us. It will ruin us. 
because there's no grace in there at all. So without the motivation of gratitude, it becomes bondage to being good. And everything, as we've said, must be motivated out of love. So obedience always follows, is, is a response of love. Uh, so biblical narratives are important for ethics because we can only understand God's laws properly when we understand biblical history. Biblical history. Fourth, biblical narratives present God's evaluation of historical events. And because His evaluations are always correct, they give us a firm ethical guidance. You remember what we said uh, about good. We said what is good, and good is that which God approves of or blesses. Evil is that which He disapproves of or punishes or curses. So in the biblical narratives, the writers illustrate all different, these different actions and thoughts and motivations, and they, t they show us either God's approval of those thoughts, actions, and motivations, or His punishment of those thoughts, actions, and motivations. And so by doing that, they give examples to you and to me on what it means to follow God, what it means to follow God, or what it means to reject God. That's what they're for. And then lastly, on occasion, the writers of biblical history recorded their own ethical comments. In other words, the, to the Spirit, they would include something in addition to simply telling you the story. And sometimes those comments are subtle, and sometimes they're obvious and blatant. For example, in Genesis 13, Mo Moses made this comment about the people of Sodom. Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. In other words, he not only tells you where Lot's living, he tells you what that place was like, what characterized that place. He gives a moral evaluation of that place. And, <clears throat> and not only calls Lot's wisdom into question, why would Lot move there? Why would Lot live there, etc.? But he anticipates the justice that God will pour down on the city uh, eventually. So there's a whole lot there. I mean, here's this terrible place. The first question that pops is, what's Lot doing there? I mean, this is a place full of wickedness. What's this guy doing? There's something wrong with Lot. There's something missing with Lot. And of course there is. But uh, And we see by his reaction when the that men of the town seek to uh, uh, rape the angels. And Lot says, here, take my daughters. <laughs> You're like, what? Who would say that? I mean, wh what kind of person would say that? Well, y y of course, that's what Moses is alluding to here. There's a problem here. And it's not just Sodom. It's Lot. Lot has a problem. And Lot's in Sodom. And Sodom's a bad place. And why is he there? What has he accommodated himself? What compromises has Lot been making? So what are the implications of using all the scriptures as our ethical standard? Well, in the first place, uh, as we've seen about historical narratives, it's true of all the other types of biblical literature as well. Every type of literature is normative. Every type of literature, literature teaches us something about the way we should think, act, and feel. And as a result, every passage in the Bible places moral obligations on us. So, for example, biblical poetry, biblical poetry uh, focuses on what? It focuses on appropriate emotional expression and describes uh, God's approval and disapproval. Uh, prophecy, what does that do? Prophecy demonstrates God's satisfaction or anger with human behavior and reveals the things that are to be gained by God's favor and the things that are to be lost by His anger or His wrath. What does wisdom literature do? Wisdom literature, literature explains God's character, which is our ultimate norm. It teaches us how to apply the principles of the law to the practical living of the Christian life. Uh, even when those considerations aren't obvious or stressed in the passage, they're always inferred in the passage. 
So consider again 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So regardless of literary genre, all of it equips Christians to please God. And since every passage of Scripture is relevant to ethics, it's legitimate to focus on the moral aspects of any given passage, even if the author wasn't emphasizing a moral aspect in that particular passage. There are moral aspects to the passage. So if we ignore the ethical implications of any portion of Scripture, we cut ourselves off from all the guidance that's being offered to us by God's revelation in Scripture. And so we conclude with that, and we'll pick it up there tomorrow. Any questions before I conclude? Okay, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you again for this evening and for the hard work of looking at your word, thinking about the implications of your word and the application it's meant to have in our lives. We pray that you would give us wisdom, that we might seek your face in all things, that we might be a people who are equipped to do that which is pleasing to you, that we might take all of Scripture seriously and not just the parts we find the easiest to read, uh, that you might teach us to delve deeply into your word, that we might be those who seek mastery, even though we realize we will always be students of your word. And we seek this in your name and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.